Um, it's Hartman here. Uh, and today uh, we are going to begin uh, my home discussions on uh, world history uh, on AP World uh, and starting with, uh, and we're going to start reviewing for the AP test. Um, this will be the homework. You need to watch this and then read this section uh, Sunday night. Uh, Sunday night, the 29th, I want to say. Yeah, 29th. You can do it anytime before that, of course, uh, if you want to get a head start. That's totally cool. Right. Um, but I'm going to cover up to page 11 uh, in the uh, review book that we're using. Okay. So um, let's take a look over here. Let's say... Um, so first off, we're going to start with, uh, the section human developments before 600 CE. Development to 600 CE, right, is where we're starting here. Um, and the very first thing is the first migrations of humans. Okay. So, um, uh, so humans come from East Africa. We are originally from East Africa, specifically uh, Ethiopia. Uh, tends to be the place that that has been designated uh, out of East Africa. Um, so uh, these first societies uh, were hunter gatherers or hunter foragers, right? Um, Okay, so that means that the way that they uh, gathered food uh, was by um, by either hunting animals or um, gathering off of wild uh, plants, um, not not growing uh, the plants themselves. Okay, um, what are some other key traits about these societies? These first societies, uh, they lived in rather uh, small groups, right? Um, usually. Um, you know, somewhere around maybe uh, 20 people or so, uh, 25 people, right? Um, no permanent home. Okay, they were, um, that means they were nomadic, right? They did not, they did not um, have their own homes that they lived in. Um, they would move in search for food and search for uh, either, you know, edible plants or, or for herds, right? Um and so as we see this, this lack of permanent homes, right, this leads to uh, a series of migrations, right? And these migrations we see uh, lead to uh, cultural and social differences between the different migratory groups, right? Uh, whether, you know, later on there's something like language or religion, right? We see that these migrations create cultural and social differences, um, okay? Um, so some of the technologies that we have uh, due to this, uh, due to these migrations, right, include things like um, I'm gonna I'm, let's see where I want to do this. Let's go here. Um, uh, technologies, right, uh, right, in order to survive in new regions, specifically fire, right, help them in colder regions outside of Africa. Um, we have stone tools as well to help them fight and and uh, uh, move and create things, uh, and then we also have um, uh, artistic uh, drawings and paintings, right? Uh, Caves of Lascaux, Caves of Altamira, stuff like that. Okay, uh, so as humans make their way out of Africa, right? Um, right, these migrations start to spread uh, humans throughout the world, right? Um, we also start to see the development of religious beliefs as well, right? Um, uh, in particular, the main type of religion at this point is something called uh, animism, right? Uh, which is uh, the um, uh, worshiping nature, um, uh, whether it's animals or, um, geographic locations, right? Which makes sense because nature was kind of all they had to go on at that point, right? Um, so, 
Um, the last thing we want to talk about then is the kind of social structure, right? Um, which as we start to see uh, these migrations, right? We do see egalitarian societies, right? Gender equality, because uh, each of the genders was responsible for aspects of uh, the hunting and gathering. Um, however, we do start to see some patriarchy, right? The domination of society by males, um, which will become a trend throughout world history, right? Um, and so uh, humans start to move out. And then by 10,000 BCE, um, we have populated the entire world, right? And then that gets us into our kind of our next big uh, section, uh, which is the agricultural revolution. Okay, so um, um, humans reached uh, all the major parts of the world that are habitable by around 10,000 BCE, uh, 15,000 for the kind of bottom of, of the Americas, right? Um, and so um, when we start to see uh, um, the full um, habitat, habiting, uh, inhabiting of the world, um, you start to see a little less ability to migrate. Um, and so that leads to some new uh, situations, new ideas here. Uh, but what we also see around this time, um, so 10,000 years ago or around 8,000 BCE, uh, we start to see uh, a global warming, right? Um, mostly because of an ice age uh, coming to an end. That ice age lasted about 4,000 years, 12,000 to 8,000 BCE. Um, and so when we see that ice age end, uh, that allows us to see the development of farming, right? Right, we start to see the planting of crops. And along with that, the raising of animals. Okay. Um, so where does this start? Well, this starts mostly in the Middle East. Um, let me actually pull up a map here, if you could bear with me just for a second. Let me get a map up. Um, all right so if i pull a map up over here okay so again uh, uh, humans started out of east africa over here in ethiopia start to spread throughout the world uh using fire and stone tools uh and then it is here in mesopotamia uh this area right here uh iraq uh syria lebanon israel uh this kind of section and then into Egypt uh, that we call the Fertile Crescent. Okay, um, and so that's where we start to see agriculture uh, 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 begin, um, and that is where we see um, the agricultural revolution. Uh, the agricultural revolution. Uh, oops, I don't need that S. Uh, begins in the Fertile Crescent, uh, or the Middle East, um, if you want to call it that. Uh, it's not all of the Middle East, which is why we tend to kind of talk about the Fertile Crescent as, a, as the main location, right? Um, but it is the, the rivers of that area and the water area, the places with water, right? And so what we see with the agricultural revolution, right, the beginning of, of farming, right, what that leads to is... Um, not everyone uh, has to produce food, right? And what does that lead to, you might ask? Well, that leads to a key term, um, specialization, right? We are now able to see people specialize into different jobs right, into non-food producing activities, right? Okay, and that's really going to lead to a much more complex system, complex societies, right? Um, and this specialization, the agricultural revolution is important, but the thing that it leads to that's, that is important, the most important is specialization. Um, and so there are a lot of things that come out of the agricultural revolution, out of specialization, Right, the first one, uh, population growth. Right, we see a lot of population growth 
uh, during this time period because there's more food for food security. Um, and we see population growth, we see the development of settlements and cities, right? Um, development of cities, right? Um, we start to see um, uh, highly skilled jobs. Uh, let's call them highly skilled specialists. All right, so for example, uh, we see things like um, artisans and merchants uh, and uh, priests. So we got uh, artisans, particularly in three key technologies, um, uh, metallurgy, right, blacksmiths, uh, textiles, um, and pottery makers, right? Those are kind of the big three. Uh, all of these have to do with farming, metallurgy to make better farming tools, textiles to, you know, either have clothing to make farming a little more comfortable or also to store uh, uh, grains. And then pottery, of course, also to store grains uh, safely um, and prevent them from getting rained on and, and becoming bad, right? Um, so we have artisans. We have also uh, merchants who start to trade these goods that people are making. Uh, and then we have priests um, who start to focus on religion. And then another one that they, they, they do kind of talk about later um, is um, government officials. Um, let's call them, uh, yeah, let's call them government officials for right now. We will call them something else later, right? Um, uh, and one of the key technologies that allows for the agricultural revolution to grow is irrigation, uh, which is the use of of um, natural water sources and kind of manipulating those uh, into uh, using them a little more efficiently for farming, right? Creating large areas of land that have uh, watered soil um, by creating things like dikes and ditches and, and dams and all these kind of things that help manipulate where the water goes, uh, which is good and also can be bad in the long time or in the long term. Um, the wheel. Right, which is a lot for transportation. The wheel also developed in Mesopotamia. Um, and then we also see uh, metal, right, bronze, and then eventually iron uh, develop as well, right, as, as more efficient, um, um, uh, more, more durable uh, tools, right, are created, right. Um, so we see, um, we see the creation of governments and technology, or excuse me, governments, uh, and policing, uh, as well as taxation, governments and taxes, right, to pay for, especially to pay for irrigation uh, 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 projects. Let me get a better arrow than that, okay? Uh, to For irrigation projects, taxes are super important um, to help pay for those, right? Um, and also um, to make sure that taxes are are being properly administered as well as making sure that trade is properly occurring, right? We see the development of writing, right? The first known writing is, is, is about taxation. Uh, so um, tax has been with us since the dawn of, of organized society, right? Um, uh, we also see the creation of more conflict, which governments help kind of alleviate um, um, Right, a better way to settle those conflicts come out of, of governments um, and stuff like that. Um, and then the other last key thing is the um, the growth of social classes, right? Social stratification, right? The problem being uh, that um, uh, those with more, you know, uh, more land uh, leads to more wealth uh, and more social power, more social, higher social standing, right? Okay. Um, on top of this, uh, we also see an increase in the patriarchal structures uh, in these societies as men tend to be the dominant force in organizing uh, governments, in organizing societies, uh, in organizing farming and jobs, which leads to a decrease in the role of women in these societies as they become much more um, about kind of taking care of the home, right? Okay, so that is um, that is the kind of early, early beginning stuff, right? Now let's go into kind of our first civilizations here, um, starting in 
uh, Mesopotamia. Okay, um, so let's get a map of the first civilizations. Um, and the thing that tends to unite all of these civilizations is that they are centered around some sort of river system, or at least water. Um, one is one is not necessarily um, um, one of these societies is not necessarily um, a, uh, a a on a river. It's on a lake. Um, let me see if I can find it. Nope, that's really tiny. Um, uh, let's see if this one works. No, not really. Um, let's see. This might be okay. Probably not, though, knowing my luck. Okay. All right. So we see here um, kind of our four major river valley societies here in the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, you have the Yellow and Yangtze River Valley in China. You have the Indus River Valley in, in uh, the Indian subcontinent uh, between Pakistan and India. Uh, you see uh, the Mesopotamian River Valley, Tigris and Euphrates uh, River Valleys is Mesopotamia. And then you see, of course, Egypt on the Nile River. Okay. Um, so... Let's start with Mesopotamia. <clears throat> okay, uh, so Mesopotamia, located on the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys in what is modern day uh, Iraq. Okay, um, key things here. Um, so their political structure, one of our, fir our, really our first political structure we're talking about is a structure known as the city state. Right, so city states are a loose, a, a loose grouping of cities in a region that are in control of themselves. Right, so we would uh, of our types of governments, we would call this heavily decentralized. Right, um, where each city is in control of its own government and nobody else outside of them is. Um, they're all highly patriarchal. I'm not going to necessarily go into too much of that here, but what I what we will say is that um, they had monumental architecture. Uh, in the form of ziggurats, right, which were um, uh, the, um, they are religious locations, right? Uh, they are places for people uh, to congregate, um, but then also is also part of a, it was kind of like the center of each city, right? Each city had its own uh, uh, individual deity for each city, right? A patron, patron god that the ziggurats tended to be uh, four. Um, and so not only would these be places for people to go worship, they'd also be, uh, uh, where the city center was, which means the markets were kind of surrounding the ziggurat as well. They, they were the epicenter of town. Um, another thing that we start to see develop is long distance trade, not just between, um, uh, um, the Mesopotamian city states, but also to Egypt in particular, and to a lesser extent to the Indus River Valley, uh, but not to China. Uh, their religion type is polytheistic, right? Uh, but again, each city-state kind of had its own god that they worshipped in particular. Um, polytheistic, the worship of many different gods, right? Um, and so um, the key people of Mesopotamia, right? Mesopotamia being the name of a region, uh, the key people here uh, are the Sumerians, uh, the Sumerians were a migratory group from the Arabian Peninsula. They moved their way into Mesopotamia, helped colonize it, uh, and they kind of kind of become the main culture of the region. Uh, and the key thing is that they developed the first writing system uh, known as uh, cuneiform. Right, the very first the the first known writing system of cuneiform, uh, which was uh, a series of kind of slashes and dots. Uh, mostly slashes to kind of signify um, different levels of taxation and revenue and stuff like that. Um, and they also wrote the first law code uh, as well, um, specifically uh, the uh, Code of Hammurabi, right, which is not per se Sumerian. Uh, it is Babylonian, um, but uh, they wrote the first law code, and then they also wrote uh, one of the first pieces of literature, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, All right? Um, okay, uh, moving on to Egypt, uh, which is, uh, well, it's in Egypt, All right? 
Uh, so Egypt borrowed a lot of stuff from uh, the Mesopotamians. They traded a lot, they interacted a lot. Uh, but one of the first things, if we look at the politics here, city-states, not Egypt, right? Egypt is heavily centralized. Um, they had a ruler known as a pharaoh. Um, Ryan, that pharaoh was in charge of everything. The pharaoh owned all the land and just gave people the rights to work on it, right? Um, they developed their own writing system. Uh, they developed hieroglyphics. They also developed some other types of writing, um, which uh, was for the common folk. Hieroglyphics more for, uh, um, you know, either pyramids or, um, um, you know, religious ceremony or official business kind of stuff. Um, they also developed uh, the, they had the development of mathematics, very early mathematics. Uh, they also had their own archi massive architecture with the pyramids. Right, so I'm going to just put massive architecture as M dot A, right? Um, what else do we need to talk about here? Um, uh, the role of women uh, was much better here. Um, they were, so I'm going to add this up here. They were uh, very, very patriarchal, heavily patriarchal, right? Women uh, could own property uh, here in Egypt, right? Um, uh, they have uh, legal equality uh, in in Egypt. Okay. Um, in fact, they are probably of our earliest societies. They are the uh, women in Egypt are the most uh, are probably the highest regarded uh, within their societies. Right now, if we go over to India and the Indus River Valley, the Indus River Valley civilization. Uh, which again is in India, uh, the Indian subcontinent, I should say, it's mostly Pakistan at this point, right? Um, two key cities here um, that we need to talk about, which is Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro. Okay, um, so these two cities are some of the only cities remaining, archaeologically speaking. Um, the thing about the Indus River Valley is that we don't have a whole as much information as you from Egypt and Mesopotamia because of uh, lack of archaeological evidence. Um, but some key things that we can say is that they had long distance trading uh, with the uh, Mesopotamians. Um, they also had their own indoor plumbing um, as well as a gridded street system, right, which kind of shows a lot of heavy sophistication. Right, we're not going to see indoor plumbing again for a while. For, and so I believe the Greeks. Um, so that's kind of a big deal. Um, gridded street system. Uh, and then also they were very polytheistic as well. Okay. Um, uh, Egypt also quite polytheistic. They had a weird situation with the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh was kind of considered a god on earth. Um, so they worshipped him as that. And then he tended to, he or she uh, tended to represent uh, a certain god. Uh, as well, Aten, Akhenaten, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, um, yeah, uh, I, don't, I can't say it, no, too much about the Egyptian religion. Um, we don't know too much more about their about the Indus River Valley because they uh, we have not translated their text yet. Um, yet being the key word there. Um, in China, uh, uh, we have the actually. Let me flip this. Um, the key place is around the Huanghe River Valley. Uh, the northern river. Um, this is not. This is. Is this the yellow? Um, so here you can see the Yangtze. Yes, this is the Yellow River. The Huanghe River, also known as the Yellow River Valley. Um, thanks, Schoology. Um, so uh, this is in China. Okay, um, and um, not a whole lot here. Uh, it is centralized under the Zhou, the Shang, uh, the Xia, the, Jan, the Shang, and the Zhou. Uh, heavily centralized there. Um, they had the oracle bones as a writing system. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, one their key religious aspect was actually um, ancestor veneration. Uh, let me actually put this in blue. This is pretty important going forward for China, right? Uh, ancestor veneration being their key way of worship. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, and then uh, the last thing that they talked about here is the Olmec uh, and, oops, excuse me, uh, the Olmec uh, in, in um, Mesoamerica. 
and the Chavin and the Andes. Uh, they didn't really say too much more about them. Um, they did trade with each other, so that's that's a thing um, to, to note, right? Um, okay, so let's take a look real quick where the Olmec and Chavin would be. The Olmec down here um, in Central America, Southern Mexico, and the Chavin being in uh, kind of down here in like modern Peru and stuff like that. Okay, all right. So uh, let's move on to religious systems. Um, I'm going to actually uh, reset this, so uh, I will be back here. All right, so back here. Um, figured actually you might as well just finish out this section. I didn't realize it was done right after this. Um, so the last thing of this very, very early section uh, is going to be early religions. Okay. Um, so there are three early religions here. Okay. Uh, the first one is going to be, um, let's put this into red, uh, Hinduism. Uh, so Hinduism uh, is developed by the Aryans um, who migrate, who are Indo-Europeans uh, from kind of the Caucasus regions. Um, Indo-Europeans uh, who migrate into India quite a long time ago, uh, and they bring their religion with them. Uh, this religion is uh, considered both polytheistic and monotheistic. Um, you tend to see it as polytheistic because it has a lot of different gods, but at the same time, it is monotheistic in that all these gods are considered to be um, a representation of one supreme god, right? Um, so... Uh, the key text of 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 uh, Hinduism, or at least the early text, are the Vedas, uh, and the Vedas are pretty important. Oh, oop, I misspelled it. I forgot the A. Uh, the Vedas here are pretty dang important. Uh, they're the original text um, that kind of outline the ideas of Hinduism, uh, and one of the key ideas that comes out of the of the Vedas is um, the idea of reincarnation. Right, the idea that the human soul is eventually reborn uh, later on, many many times, um, and eventually um, you will be liberated uh, from uh, the earthly soul, um, attain moksha, um, and join the supreme god. Um, right, and the way that you kind of organize this system, right? How how do you know you're getting closer to uh, uh, unifying with the supreme deity uh, is the idea of the caste system, right? So the caste system, right, puts people onto different levels, right? A, a social uh, structure, a social hierarchy uh, in society where uh, people at the top are much closer to unifying with the supreme deity, uh, with the supreme god, um, whereas people in the lower castes are are not, right? Um, so when we have this, this is a very rigid social hierarchy, right? Which means there is a lack of social mobility, right? So you can't really move anywhere at all in this caste system, at least in this life, right? Um, so that's Hinduism. Uh, our next one we're going to briefly talk about, super briefly, is Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism is the first kind of uh, official monotheistic religion, um, right? The first full-on religion that believes in only one deity, um, Zarathustra, right? Um, this is born in Persia, in the Persian Empire, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Um, and so the key things here are free will, right? The idea that humans have free will, and then the the idea that the world, that history, that life is um, an eternal battle uh, between good and evil. Um, there's a lot of other stuff here that they didn't talk about that's super important for its influences on Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. Um, mainly, its idea of kind of a a a devil character for Christianity, a day of judgment. Um, those kind of things, but um, we're not going to talk about those. It didn't seem too important uh, for the AP test. The last one, of course, not of course necessarily, but uh, is Judaism, right? Uh, this is the first, uh, not the first monotheistic religion, but it is certainly um, 
very, very popular, very important to know about, right? They, they talk about the most influential example, right? Um, so this grew up in Israel, um, in modern day Israel, right? You had the uh, you had the Hebrews and the Israelites who both followed Judaism. Uh, they trace their uh, religion, they trace their origins back to Abraham, right? Which is what's called an Abrahamic religion. There are two others, uh, Islamic Christianity, right? Um, they have a God, uh, one God called Yahweh, uh, which is just God in Hebrew, right? Um, and that they, they kind of formed a, a pact with Yahweh. Um, uh, this is, let me rewrite all of Yahweh. I did not write that very well. Yeah. Um, so Yahweh, um, right, basically is one God, and in return for devotion uh, to Yahweh, they become the chosen people of of Yahweh, right? Um, and then the codification of of their scripture comes in the Old Testament, right? Uh, that is the kind of uh, the history, but also like uh, uh, the the scriptures of of the Hebrews, right? Um, and then also, as I said, right, this greatly influences Christianity uh, and Islam. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Uh, all right. So uh, classical era is our next section. Okay. Um, classical era. Uh, which lasts from 600 BCE to 600 CE. Uh, I think that last section I accidentally wrote 600 CE up here at 600. The first part's up to 600 BCE. Okay, so there are um, four major regions that they want to talk about. There is the Eurasian empires, Eurasian societies, Persia, Greeks, Romans, and Byzantines, uh, Southern Asia and India with Mauryans and the Gupta, uh, Eastern Asia and China with the Chin and the Han, and then in Mesoamerica, the Mayans, right? Um, but one of the key things of this section that starts to um, uh, blend people across large regions is major uh, trade routes. Okay, we see the development of our first major trade routes, international trade routes, uh, the Silk Road being the main one. And then the two um, uh, sea-based ones, the Mediterranean Network and the Indian Ocean Network being the three kind of key uh, uh, trade routes of the era, right? And they talked about kind of major cities uh, that develop out of these trade networks, uh, Rome, Constantinople, Damascus, Pataliputra, and Chang'an. Okay, so we're actually going to make our way first into South Asia. Uh, we are going to make our way into India again um, with the development of another religion um, that is Buddhism. Now, a lot of people tend to associate Buddhism with East Asia, but it was actually developed in India uh, and then uh, exported to um, exported to East Asia and then kind of lost its 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 popularity. Um, in, in India, as we see the arrival of Islam later. Okay, so the founder is Siddhartha Gautama, who is a uh, high-class uh, Indian son uh, who is set to kind of be very wealthy, very powerful. Um, and a, he is Hindu, uh, but uh, he starts to see a lot of suffering that people endure. And to understand this suffering, he kind of goes out on an expedi expedition and a meditation. Um, and then um, he kind of finds this, this answer after meditating under a Bodhi tree. Uh, and he becomes Buddha uh, or the enlightened one. Okay. Um, so he starts to spread that. And the doctrine of Buddhism revolves around two key ideas. One of them being the four noble truths, and the other being the eightfold path. The four noble truths are the ideas that um, um, all life is suffering. Suffering is created by desire. To end suffering, you must end desire, and to end desire, you must follow the eightfold path. 
um, which the Eightfold Path is a series of things just saying, hey, live, live moderately, right? Refrain from excess, right? Don't forget to meditate, those kind of things, right? Um, and the goal of, of Buddhism is to achieve enlightenment uh, and reach uh, that enlightenment, that place of enlightenment, oops, uh, enlightenment uh, known as nirvana. Right. So it's got a lot of similarities to Hinduism, because which makes sense because Buddha was, Siddhartha Gautama was uh, Hindu over time. Um, this is a reincarnation, uh, uh, right? This, uh, this is a reincarnation religion. Um, you reincarnate until you achieve this enlightenment, right? Uh, and, and reach nirvana, okay? Um, so uh, the spread of Buddhism. Um, this became very popular with lower caste people uh, because it did not um, it did not talk about any or it did not talk about having this very the rigid social structure uh, because um, uh, it rejects the caste system right altogether. Okay, um, and then from here uh, it spreads. Uh, specifically to Central, uh, East, and Southeast Asia uh, along the Silk Roads and the Indian Ocean Network. All right, so it spreads to these different places via merchants and missionaries, mostly merchants, honestly, with Buddhism. Not, I shouldn't say mostly, but, but merchants played a very big role, right? Um, and so um, one of the things about uh, Buddhism or two things about Buddhism is that it's a kind of a missionary religion, right? Which made it very popular, right? Actively seeks out converts, right? Not all religions do Judaism in particular, right? Judaism has a, has a concept of the chosen people. And so they're not necessarily going to go out and say, Hey, everybody's chosen. Whereas Buddhism is a missionary religion, actively seeking converts. And it's also a monastic religion, which means that what we see, is the development of monastery communities, right? Uh, which is also a big um, a, a big boon to its popularity because what this allows is for maybe less less off people to find salvation, uh, to find safety uh, in these monastic communities, right? All right, so that's uh, Buddhism. Let me actually do a thing up here. Um, we'll talk about uh, um, instead of India, let's say uh, South Asia. Right, because now we're going to talk about some politics in South Asia, um, and we're going to start with the Mauryan Empire. Okay, so the Mauryan Empire, um, who are the first to unify uh, South Asia uh, in the fourth uh, century BCE uh, to the second century. Okay, uh, and the uh, founder is Chandragupta Maurya, all right? Uh, but the main man to know about here uh, is Ashoka. Uh, Ashoka, probably one of the most important rulers in Indian history. Um, he did a bunch of things. He created an, an efficient tax system. Uh, he created a lot of roads and postal service systems and, and, and places for people uh, to, to rest. Um, and then he also had the Rock and Pillar Edicts. Uh, I'm actually going to put this in blue, um, uh, which is how he promulgated not only his uh, law code, but also a uh, Buddhist thought, right? Um, and that's one of the other key things about Ashoka is he's quite possibly the major reason that Buddhism becomes a international religion. Um, he converts to Buddhism, uh, especially after a battle uh, at Kalinga, I believe, where he was, it was quite bloody, and he was like, "Hey, we shouldn't do this anymore." Uh, he converts to Buddhism and helps spread it in South Asia uh, and beyond, right? Um, and so after him, we kind of start to see them decline, uh, and that's kind of the end of the Mauryans. Um, and so then, so the key thing though, first unify and Ashoka and uh, Buddhism that he kind of brought along with. The second one, uh, after a few centuries of disunity, is the Gupta. 
Okay, the Gupta um, rules from the um, from the fourth to the sixth century CE. Right, so quite a long time, about five hundred years or so of of independence uh, in India. Right. Um, this is considered. I'm going to put this in this color, uh, just because I've wanted to for a while in class. We've talked a lot about like, man, I wish I had a yellow marker. Uh, this is the golden age of India. Now, what is a golden age? Well, a golden age is a, usually a combination of an economic boom and a cultural boom, right? Some sort of cultural uh, development happening, right? Um, so um, key, key things that make it a golden age is the development of medicine uh, and also that they have created hospitals, right, for that medicine to thrive in. Uh, mathematicians, right? The um, we actually see the development of the uh, Hindu numeral system, right? Which of course will eventually become uh, the Arabic numerals that we know today, zero through nine, right? Um, that's kind of the major reason, right? Their developments in medicine and their developments in mathematics are kind of the key things there. Um, they promote Hinduism. And they also promote a highly patriarchal society. Uh, both of these things help really uh, explain why India is today Hindu and for a very long time, and, and honestly, probably today, uh, is quite patriarchal. Okay. All right. Let's make our way over to East Asia. Okay. Um, in East Asia, um, we see... Um, the Zhou Dynasty uh, unifies China for a very long time, 800 years. Uh, but towards the back end of, of their dynasty, we see them kind of decline. Um, and it leads to um, the period of the Warring States for about 200 years, which is probably one of the worst times in, in Chinese history. Uh, lots of conflict, lots of death going on. And so people were trying to find answers. Um, and... Um, before we talk about those answers, though, the Zhou Dynasty do leave us with kind of a key component of Chinese political systems, uh, which is the Mandate of Heaven. Okay, so what is the Mandate of Heaven? Um, is the It's the way that we see justification for imperial control, right, that the heavens... Uh, the ancestors have given um, this particular ruler, this particular dynasty, uh, the right to rule the mandates to rule China, um, and that if uh, the ruler is corrupt uh, or terrible, uh, we will see um, we will see the gods angry or the ancestors angry through natural disasters. Right, natural disasters. If we have poor rulers, right, famine, plague, things like that, right. Um, and so we see uh, a lot of uprisings occur due to the mandate, the concept of the mandate of heaven, right. And when you do have uh, a, a famine uh, occur, right, that would a lot of times lead to uprisings, not just because of lack of food, but because of the mandate of heaven concept. Okay. All right. So two new philosophies, two new religions come into play during the period of the Warring States. Uh, the first one being Confucianism. Uh, so Confucianism, um, of course, created by Confucius, uh, who was a traveling teacher. Um, he was a kind of failed. Um, uh, um, he was a failed uh, uh, bureaucrat, uh, and so he went around teaching instead. Uh, Confucius and Buddha live almost at the exact same time, which is pretty cool. Um, so the book that his writings are found in, or his beliefs are found in, oops, are the Analects, right? His, his students follow, uh, wrote these down. Um, and the key things that, um, uh, talking about is, um, uh, it's a focus on, uh, relationships, focus on relations and how you kind of live in everyday life. Right, like how you should treat others and stuff like that. 
Um, there is no deity. There is no God in this religion slash philosophy. It's really not a religion. It's mostly a philosophy. Um, it talks about, um, it focuses a lot on how to be educated, on how to show respect to others, uh, either below or above you, right? Uh, especially the emperor, right? And then also uh, having a patriarchal uh, system because that just creates order, right? The, 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 um, the biggest concept of, of Confucianism is order, right? That's like the thing it wants the most, uh, which makes sense because it's in a very chaotic time. Uh, and so they want to restore order, right? Um, they also talked about the filial piety, right? The duty to one's ancestors. Okay. Um, and that's about it for Confucianism for now. Uh, super duper important philosophy will come up uh, quite a lot in Chinese history. Right, uh, and then the the other major philosophy, which is closer to a religion, is Taoism. Um, not nearly as important as Confucianism, um, but so Confucianism is more is, is harmony with one another. Um, Taoism is harmony instead with nature. Right? That is the key component. It is talking about um, uh, we have a lot of internal reflection. Um, you have a lot of, of especially through meditation, uh, the idea of just kind of going one, being one with nature, right? Or like letting nature kind of take its path and, and just adapting to it uh, that as you need. Okay. Um, so the, the two dynasties we really want to talk about during this time period for China are the Qin and the Han. Um, we're going to start with the Qin. Oops, let me, let's, uh, let's get a better... The Qin Dynasty, which does not last for a particularly long time, uh, yet it is quite important. Um, they are the first to centralize China uh, completely, right? They centralized the whole thing. The Zhou had centralized quite a bit of it, but not all of it, right? Um, there's a bunch of key things that the Qin do that's all almost about order. Um, uh, they create a uniform script. Uh, they create standard weights and measures. Script being a written language, uh, standard weights and measures means that things are are measured the same in the different regions, which means that trade is much more uh, beneficial to people because they know they're not getting ripped off. Um, so, you know, hey, if this thing weighs 10 pounds over here and 12 pounds over here, right, I'm going to go to the place and sell it where it's considered to be 12 pounds, right, because I'll make more money. Right. Um, he built canals and roads, right, which, again, been very beneficial for uniting the country and also for trade, right, making trade a lot better. Right. So he, uh, the Qin Dynasty helped create a lot of prosperity. However, it was also a terrible, terrible empire. Um, and so uh, it was pretty quickly defeated uh, or uh, people rebelled and took over. And that leads us into the Han Dynasty, which lasts from the second century, sorry, the third century BCE to the third century CE. Um, really overlaps with another society we're going to talk about later on um, that you all know pretty well, right? Um, and the Han Dynasty is probably are they are they really saying this? Uh, it's one of the golden ages of China. Uh, for a few reasons, um, mostly uh, because it was peaceful, right? Uh, peace and prosperity um, throughout the realm, uh, which is a huge deal. Um, but then also technology, uh, the compass, right? The rudder, stern post rudder, which allows you to maneuver a ship. Uh, and of course, paper, uh, a big deal. Right. Although, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing just fine without it, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so um, they, they, they expanded trade as well. Right. And in particular, um, uh, their goods, their main good, of course, was silk. Right. That's the main good that they're trading. Uh, porcelain being another big one as well. Um, but the key thing, maybe it's probably the key thing here, uh, is the creation of the civil service exam. 
okay, which um, created an educated workforce and educated bureaucracy, um, and then also created opportunities for um, social uh, um, social mobility, right? Because anybody could take these civil service exams, and anybody could get accepted to become a bureaucrat. And bureaucrats in China are considered quite um, uh, um, prestigious, right? Okay. Uh, and the key, another key thing about the civil service exam is that it emphasized Confucianism, uh, which helps cement Confucianism's role uh, in Chinese history going forward. Okay. All right, let's now make our way into our last section for the day, um, which is going to be um, the uh, Western Eurasia, um, which uh, includes quite a lot of important information and important societies, right? So um, the first one we're gonna talk about here is Persia, okay, which is in modern day uh, Iran, or at least centered around modern day Iran. Okay. Uh, they are founded by Cyrus the Great or Cyrus the Shepherd. Okay. So Cyrus the Great is the founder of the Persian Empire. Um, typically, it's called the Achaemenid Empire, right? Um, and so, one of the key things about the Persian Empire, a lot of key things, but they are administrative uh, developments, right? Administrative innovations. Uh, in government. Okay, so what we mean by that is that they create a much more uh, 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 centralized government. They create a strong bureaucracy. All right? What are what's a bureaucracy? Well, those are the people who work in the government that are appointed by the by the governors uh, to help run the government. They make things much more efficient. Right. Um, they also create a road network. Right. Um, that is very important to the Persian Royal Road. Okay. Um, and then we also have a very uh, ethnically and culturally diverse uh, empire. Right. Which is very important. Right. It helps... Um, uh, uh, create a, a, a economic and social uh, uh, boom in the society. And the government actually promoted this by promoting religious tolerance, uh, allowing people to practice their religions as long as they pay taxes, not necessarily tax on religion, just taxes in general, right? Um, so there's a lot about Persia. Persia is super cool, um, but we got to move on. Um, it's not It's not super, super part of our um, uh, curriculum anymore, unfortunately. Uh, and we're going to make our way over to Greece. Okay. Um, Greece is a series of what are called the polis. So politically, uh, it is city-states, which, as we saw in Mesopotamia, is heavily decentralized as opposed to Persia, which is heavily centralized under one emperor. Right. Um, the reason being, uh, the reason most likely for this is the terrain of the uh Greek peninsula of the Balkan peninsula. It's very mountainous and hilly. And so it's kind of just naturally divided like that. Um, one key thing that they did share though, is a share of a polytheistic religion. Uh, the Greek pantheon, uh, we tend to call it. Um, they had, uh, the other thing about the, um, these gods is that they were human. They had human qualities. Right, Zeus, Athena, uh, Hera, Heliod, etc., etc. Right, and so um, two key cities here: Athens. Uh, Athens is known as uh, a kind of technological development. Um, they talk about architecture, literature, theater, and philosophy. Um, they have a golden age, um, but we're going to focus on democracy. Right. They kind of create the first democracy uh, that we really know about, um, where a large part of the, pop the population is in charge of the governments. Um, all free adult males were able to participate in their society. Uh, and then we're going to focus on the philosophy uh, of you know Plato, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. 
um, also architecture with the Parthenon and the kind of uh, very geometric rigid formations. Um, yeah, uh, and Sparta, right? Uh, it's very militaristic society. Uh, they had to be to um, take control of the helots, uh, the, the slaves that they have conquered. Um, so we see, um, because of this, we see a lot of much more gender equality here because while the men are out fighting, uh, the women are kind of in charge of society um, as well as the elderly and slaves. So these two societies very much at odds. We see them find the Peloponnesian Wars, um, but eventually they are conquered uh, by uh, an outsider. We tend to think is Greek, is actually not. He's Macedonian, um, Alexander the Great. Who we'll talk about, I think, I think we'll talk about it later, maybe not. Um, who spreads the uh, uh, spreads Greek culture to India and Persia, uh, creating what's called the Hellenistic world, right? Or the spread of Hellenism. Uh, Hellenism being the Greek culture, uh, Greece itself in Greek is called Hellas, so that's why it's called that. All right, next up is Rome. Okay, and then after Rome, we're probably going to have to reset into a new page again. Um, so Rome uh, is a heavily borrowed culture from Greeks. Um, a lot of aspects of Roman culture is Greek. Uh, in origin, uh, their religion in particular, uh, as as one of them. Um, let's see here, uh, especially religion, uh, and even to an extent, their government style. Right, um, they had a a republic at first. Right, a representative government style. Right, where people vote on representatives uh, for them, which is very similar to democracy. Not totally, but very similar. Um, they also came up with the concept of innocent until proven guilty. Uh, in the court of law, which is a big deal. Um, they also, they wrote a law code uh, known as the 12 Tables. Uh, the key thing about the 12 Tables is that's a public law code. Uh, so that people know their rights. Um, and a lot of these rights really kind of passed down to us here. Um, and then that helps kind of check the power of the governments. Um, we have a very patriarchal society here, uh, as most of Greece did. Uh, they talk about women had a little more power here. I don't necessarily. Uh, they talk about um, uh, own and inherit property and initiate divorces. But, uh, you know, it's not, it's not that much better. Um, Rome eventually expands to conquer the entire Mediterranean. Uh, conquers all the Mediterranean, called Mare Nostrum or the Roman Lake. Um, and then it starts to really get quite big um, and then eventually forms a new type of government, um, very similar to Persia. So it starts out very similar to Greece culturally, uh, but then politically it becomes similar to Persia with a large central government and the road, larger road network that they build as well. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, they also built aqueducts to help kind of uh, get water to cities uh, from, from um, uh, mountainous areas, uh, as well as uh, large stadiums for public entertainment, for coliseums. Um, and stuff like that. Um, the problems that we see here, uh, the problems that, that kind of crop up uh, for the Romans over time, uh, which by the way, Rome lasts from, do they give us, do they give us a full, yeah, um, they last from the 8th century BCE uh, to the 5th century CE. Uh, now there are there are really three, but let's say for our purposes two uh, 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 stages. The first stage, uh, the Republic, uh, is basically all of the BCE era, uh, and then the Empire is the last 500 years or so. 
and the Empire problems, um, uh, they overextended their kind of range. They get way too big. Um, they overextend, and so they get way too big. Uh, we see it corrupt uh, rulers in particular. Um, they get very, they get really bad. The rulers are pretty terrible by the end. Um, and then um, we also get um, some some smallpox and plagues uh, epidemics that they do not deal with it at all very well. Um, I think we'll be able to probably be talking about that a little bit more. Um, and so when we see invasions by Germanic tribes, uh, that leads to their full on collapse. Uh, in 476, uh, which used to be a number we care about, but we don't anymore. Um, and so that's going to lead to a creation of a more um, decentralized Western Europe, Europe in general, but specifically Western Europe, because what we see is the Eastern portion sticks around. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit uh, with the Byzantines. Okay. Um, but I got to reset this page. So if y'all bear with me, I'm um, once again to be right All back. All right, so last section for today um, is the continuation of Rome. Um, but instead of talking about Romans, we're actually going to, well, we're going to talk about Romans, but we're going to talk about the development, the most important things that the thing to come out of uh, the Roman Empire is the development of Christianity. Um, so first off, um, Rome practiced religious tolerance to an extent um, you had to worship the um, emperor as a god, uh, and you had to pay taxes. Um, so, um, if you're polytheistic, which most people were, this was pretty easy. Um, but uh, the monotheistic groups, particularly the Jews, um, this isn't super easy, right? Because they have one god, so they're not going to um, worship the emperor as a god because that is against their religion uh and so uh the jews clash with the uh uh with the with the romans right the romans have conquered the jews uh and so this leads to a diaspora of the jewish people all right the spread of the uh uh the the uh, dissemination of the jews through northern africa and europe as they looked to uh, uh practice their religious freedom um, so, um, one of the Jewish leaders, uh, uh, is a guy by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, he becomes a, a Jewish, a leader of a Jewish community. Um, and his teachings were things like, Hey, there's a kingdom of God, um, that we're all a part of, um, you know, don't worship the emperor stuff like that. Um, and so because of these things, uh, he's executed by the Romans. Uh, but uh, for him, this is kind of a part of the plan because he was supposed to die for the sins of humanity. Um, and so um, his followers uh, become known as Christians. Uh, they are known as Christians because he's considered Christ. Uh, that is that is the kind of name he is given. Uh Christ being uh, the the um, savior of humans sent by God, right? Uh, Yahweh, right? The same Jewish God. Okay, um, so they spread, start to spread the religion, um, uh, and so uh, after the death of Jesus, uh, they continue to spread the religion. Um, and this isn't particularly a religion that's attractive to two groups of people uh, that uh, are not usually, uh, um, you know are not usually targeted by uh, religion, and that is poor uh, poor people and women, um, mostly because of its kind of idea of spiritual equality, right, of equality in the eyes of God, right? Um, so uh, um, they continue to be persecuted uh, until uh, made the official religion of the empire uh, in the 4th century uh, of the Roman Empire by Constantine. Uh, sorry, he doesn't make it official. He makes it uh, uh, legal, right? Um, officials later on, Theodosius, but that doesn't matter. Um, and so that leads to uh, massive growth in the in the religion. 
uh, growth of popularity, and then basically, and by the time of the end of the Roman Empire, a few hundred years later, it is the most popular religion in the empire. Um, another key thing, it is a, they call a universal religion, or what we're going to call a monastic religion, uh, which allowed for enclaves of men and women um, to devote their, their life to it. Uh, and so that is uh, the beginnings of Christianity. We'll obviously talk much more about that later on. Uh, last thing we want to talk about in this uh, in today's lesson is the Byzantines. Okay, um, so the Byzantines are just the Eastern Roman Empire. Okay, they are the eastern portion of the Roman Empire. Okay, uh, centered around uh, the city of Constantinople. Um, right, so Rome kind of kind of took uh, the entire Mediterranean. Uh, region, right? But uh, the the Byzantine Empire kind of takes the eastern half. Basically, the Balkan Peninsula is over, um, and then the city of Istanbul uh, today, known as the city of Istanbul, uh, once was Constantinople, and that was the center of their empire. Okay, um, so um, they had actually moved the capital. The Romans moved the capital to Constantinople uh, early on. Um, and then, um, once the, the fall of Rome, the Western Rome occurs, right? We see the creation of this empire. Um, let's see here. Um, so, um, what are we talking about here? So, um, the city of Constantinople, uh, is super important. Uh, it is considered what they call an entrepot. An entry point, uh, a kind of main uh, trade center, um, a coastal trade center uh, on the Black and Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so it connected those two regions. It also connected Asia and Europe, right? Um, and so it was a huge, huge, huge uh, trade center early on uh, during this time period. Um, they will. Um, they will kind of, uh, their, their most important Byzantine ruler is a guy by the name of Justinian the Great. Uh, Justinian the Great is known for a few things. Uh, the Code of Justinian being one of them. Uh, he writes a law code that will become the major um, uh, law code throughout Europe uh, for quite a long time. Even the French under Napoleon will, will utilize it. Uh, and then the construction of a very famous church, the Hagia Sophia, uh, which is built in the 6th century, right? Um, so the Byzantine Empire will last for another 900 years uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, of, of course, eventually they will shrink quite quite a bit uh, at the hands of the Ottomans and the Seleucids. Um, but, uh, sorry, not the Seleucids, the um, Seljuks, the Seljuk Turks. Uh, but that's uh, it for today. Uh, so I will see you guys tomorrow with a lot more coming on. Uh, I apologize for this being so long. They might all be this long, um, but hopefully uh, this is quite helpful. So thank you guys. See you tomorrow.